welcome to Dialogue for hardworking students or people too busy with their jobs. Seeking people for social activities can be time-consuming and often frustrating. Not so anymore. The new trend of dads is taking off in China, where people get together to do things they enjoy, such as hiking, discussing comic books, or eating northeastern barbecue. How is this different from social groups of the past? Why has it become so popular? And do these temporary friendships to some degree reflect a degrading ability for people to create and manage intimate relationships? To find out more, I'm glad to be joined by Dr. Judy Kransky, Professor of Psychology and Education at the Columbia University Teachers College. Gary Moore, core team of High Street. David Moser, Associate Professor at Capital Normal University in Beijing. Duan Yan Lim, board member of a block-based trust, and Bo Shang Yan, graduate student from Columbia University Teachers College. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Hello, welcome to Dialogue. So we are talking about this new trend uh, for socializing. I guess we are talking about the generation of uh, Bo Shang or Gary. Uh, I will start with you, Boisham. I know you spend most of the time in the U.S., but you do have friends, you do have, uh, you know, uh, uh, classmates back in China, and they do uh, practice in such a style, Daz style. Tell us, what's your understanding? What is Daz? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So I think Daz, as I have observed, is for, like, specific social activities that people have kind of this accompaniment and they can go with uh, their dads together to engage in uh, social activities that they enjoy. So uh, different people may have different definitions of that, but I think that's my definition for mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Gary, I guess you heard of it or you may do it by yourself. Where did it start? Uh, so, I mean, for, for me, right, the, I guess you could say the, the first dad that you know, I really kind of knew of was really around the, you know, the murder mysteries. Um, you know, people just coming together to uh, essentially just like role play a murder mystery, come together. But it really is something that you often see, um, as I said before, it, it can be quite temporary. So uh, one minute it can be that, then it can be ultimate Frisbee, then it can be um, a host of other, you know, sports. And oftentimes it was activities and games uh, it was the context that, that I knew it in. Mm -hmm. uh, David, you, you, your students, uh, basically, this is a, the, the, the lifestyle, part of the lifestyle of your students, I guess, uh, in their, you know, uh, around 2018, 19, 20s. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I guess you are also observing uh, the changing lifestyle. You have been in China for almost 30 years. Yeah, actually, uh, I had I had a class with my students this morning, and I actually asked them about that <laughs> because I didn't know. <laughs> so, much what's about the result? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I have two I have two uh, data sets. One is the a little bit with my Chinese students, but also I think uh, there's a little bit of my daughter in the United States, who's not quite the right age. She's 25, a little old maybe, but um, I think there might be some similarities. But what they told me is that. Um, they have close friends that they see every day, and especially at a campus, they basically see the same people all the time. But they like to to go out into other parts of Beijing or do other things, and they, and they like to do that with uh, other people that they don't know so well because they're kind of tired of the same people. So they'll so they said uh, one of them said uh, they have their uh, Korean barbecue dads and. Um, uh, their, uh, let's see, their mountain climbing dads or something. People that they know like these things and they aren't really good friends, but they know they like them, so they do them together. That's what I gleaned from what they said. Okay, uh, uh, Judy, uh, Dr. Judy, you know, you are known in, as Dr. Judy in China, you know, for your books, for your lot of training uh, a few years back of uh, Chinese doctors in terms of uh, you know, consulting. Uh, so psychologically, uh, you know, is, is, what do you see it? Is this, um, you know, basically such a practice meet the people's need, young people's need, psychologically need, psychologically or maybe uh, need to, to socialize? Very well said. And I totally see this as a positive trend because it is encouraging this social, emotional development 
that a lot of Chinese students need in general, and also from recovering from the loneliness and the isolation of this horrible COVID lockdown. So it is a really entry point into saying, you know what, I'm going to get together with other people and call them compartmentalized friends, but it has the possibility to really grow and develop into stronger friendships. So it gives you a little safety to say, well, I'm not really going to start deep friendships, but we're going to have buddies and we're going to join on a special issue. And guess what? As you said, I have very many books translated into Chinese. One of them is about the guide to dating. And my biggest advice is get together on a subject you both and all of you enjoy. And that creates bonding and growing friendships. Well, uh, we will come back to this uh, interesting you know, uh, practice. For example, if you have the same topic, both uh, love to talk about and love to do, and that might bring you to somewhere else, maybe a long-term exactly. or stable relationship. Uh, so before that, uh, Yan Ling, you know, how do you see this is different from the previous or the practice in the past? So for example, you have a few years back, we have Luyu basically. Uh, traveling companion, you know, um, mates or friends, also temporary, kind of, to travel to other places. Mm -hmm. And like a book club, you know, people enjoy reading, we'll get together. I feel that, you know, we always have these terms for the interest group, Xinxu Xiaozu, right? And different generations always, this is nothing new. But I found this word is very interesting. If you listen to this word, that you can feel this, uh, there's a new meme. And this is a very, very trendy word called meme culture, which is the youngsters are really fragments their interests and their groups, and then specify using the coded language. So, so, so you know, the, somebody from their out of their community will never even know what, what that is that, and then interests. But somehow this kind of culture, meme culture are, I. As you know, we every year we do Beijing design, we, we do a social design challenge with one topic was a single hood uh, house design, which is mostly based on psychology needs and social needs and in terms of this, the cultural challenges. But I love this word because it sounds easy, that you can see there's a light hardness of this youth group. They feel like I just want to be, you know, a part of it, just a very lighthearted. I can be very flexible and I also can, can be just a single little node in this little cluster. So this meme culture, I think is very, very important to use this word to, to enter. When you know this word, you're part of the group. So I think there's a very interesting meme culture coming into the digital living, which we, after COVID, especially we see, uh, we really living firstly locally. We want to entry different spaces, but very limited. But through interest groups, through digital tools, we enter a much bigger uh, global even uh, community identity. So that's, I think, is the kind of one of this for me phenomenon. And I also bring this uh, humor. Always I found it fascinating with uh, the Chinese youth uh, in this um, digital age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and this digital age. So Bo Shang, you know, based on your understanding, you know, what exactly are your friends looking for when they are looking for adults uh, on certain topics? Uh, uh, is that, that something beyond their comfortable bubble, for example, their usual community? Yes, uh, I do believe, I do agree with uh, the meme culture comment. Like, I do believe that this is like a special element of it, uh, I, like differentiating it from maybe just a book club or interest groups. And from what I see from my friends, when they are looking for does, uh, because friends uh, cannot always be in the same city at the same time and doing all the things together. So when they are looking for does, they are really looking for like accompaniment, like someone to go to something that they enjoy together. Uh, and without maybe too much planning or too much, uh, mm -hmm trying to think about like in the future extending uh, the relationship to make it long term like of course it cannot it can be long term and it has always has the potential to grow into a long term friendship but uh, it's really there's no pressure of doing so so they're looking for this kind of like a like not so stressful and uh, this very casual kind of accompaniment uh, and just to basically enjoy social activities, not alone, but with someone or some two or three other people. Mm -hmm. 
she is really saying when you take away the expectations on a relationship, it can grow. And this is true for across the board, but certainly for young people, but older people too, when you're dating, supposedly, the way the expectations, you can express yourself, you can feel more free, and then the relationship can grow. And so many of the other students, we talked about this last night in my class at Columbia. And so another one of the students, Taiwai, was talking about how even her friends call their groupings Dazi in order to just have a word to explain what they're getting together. And another student was talking about how it's become very compartmentalized. Like he, he was talking about a graduation entrance exam so that they can really find a way to focus their interest and their needs because young people have to express their needs and this gives them a platform for it. Mm. Uh, Gary, so it's kind of like setting young people free, uh, for example, probably yes. take away the expectation, as Dr. Judy mentioned, and also, you know, it's like there's no obligation to probably to meet again or whatever, but, uh, you know, it depends, right? Yeah, so I, mean, I think that you said the key words there perfectly. I think with the no expectations, there's another angle too, which is the no expectations for who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. right? I think that before, even when I look at, you know, my childhood in high school, um, we only viewed the world as certain settings. Like there's only the classroom setting, there's the home setting, and then there's maybe the playground setting. But there's this perception that, okay, if you're shy in the classroom, oh, well, you're shy everywhere. You're not gonna be very good socially. But what I notice even when, when I'm in these certain groups, sometimes I'll see the same person in, in a multiple context. And on one side, they can be super aggressive, super like, you know, very um, self-assured, very public. And then in the dinner setting, they're very quiet, right? And so in this case, it kind of al creates that allowance that people can be dynamic, that they don't have to be this singular thing that everyone expects you to be. And sometimes without that chance of moving from place to place to place so freely, again, without expectation, um, you never get a chance. You just sit there frustrated. You're like, oh my gosh, I I'm so humorous, but nobody knows because I'm just in the wrong setting, you know? That's yeah. really beautiful. I think another word there that's so important is that psychologically, it gives young people permission. You can yeah. be who you are. Mm -hmm. And there are so many demands, especially put on Chinese students from their parents, I have to say. You know, you have to be this, you have to behave, you have to be good in school, you have to do this. So therefore they can expand themselves, as Gary was saying, express different parts of themselves. And that's fantastic. I mean, if they're ending up going on the little red book and trying to find different groups that are like themselves where they can be different and be who they are that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. well yanling obviously we are talking about this uh, you know particular point in terms of social development now you have social media you have this uh, uh, I, I guess young we are talking about young people uh, who were born in the 19 after 1990 let's say or even after the 2000 you know they have grown up in the times of uh, greater uncertainty and uh, fluidity uh, probably that contributes to this uh, kind of needs, kind of uh, practice? 100%. But also I noticed you tried to correct me about digital space, but I really did. This is a uh, meme from the youngster. They call it a digital living, a physical and digital living. So, so the way that I see this trend is one thing is our entire society, our entire planet, entire social structure going fluid. We can see there are lots of fluid are allowed, are, are also needed uh, from institution to innovations. And, and our age is a qua jie, cross, cross discipline is a big thing. These days it's just a norm. I think the youth, youth just have a little bit more gamified version and a little bit uh, um, bottom up like an edge culture try out way to lead this so-called fluidity trend. And that, that young man said really clearly, because if we are not expected to be certain person, we can show our dynamic self, that freedom will give us the essence of being who we are really. 
I think, but also I want to mention one very important problem we need to mention here is yes, we talk about fluidity, we talk about lighthearted, no expectation, but deep down, deep down, we all still uh, need those deep connections and the much, much more profound connection. But that will be actually facilitated like a yin yang by this whole ultra fluided. Um, expect no expectation, no responsibility, no engagement, no commitment, but maybe down to something we actually distill something also anchor ourselves. I think that's going to be uh, like a duality coming up into service. I, I, what I wonder about and what Yanning says is very interesting, and I'd be curious to see what Dr. Judy and Bo Shan have to say. But for me, looking back uh, on the way I used to uh, try to get the same thing out of a friendship group, we didn't have the Internet or, or social media when I was going through this young phase. And what it strikes me as in some sense, this Dadza kind of mimics or imitates or re, or sort of reconvenes a kind of in, a kind of social media sensation where uh, nowadays people have m many more contacts than we could ever have in the past because, you know, it's there's a, a, a touch of the button and there's so many uh, groups that are participating and adding, you know, information. It seems like the, the, the students or these young people uh, sort of have an affinity or a, this is this this way of interacting feels natural to them because it sort of mimics their internet experience of social media and I'm sort of wondering if if maybe that's a difference in the generations because for me that sort of experience would not be very satisfying because I tend to want uh, you know more more interaction more inter more more who uh, don't what do you say synergy uh, in the conversation. I don't want to be just a little uh, player, you know, I want to make it interesting, but for these, but it seems like the younger children sort of crave or at least feel comfortable in this kind of a setting. Okay, uh, Dr. Judy, what's your, what's your comments, what's your response, you know, uh, you know, Yan Ling and uh, David mentioned about their observation, they are very familiar with the Chinese society, basically living inside the, the society for a long time. Yeah, I, I think that this really has a lot to do, uh, as uh, even Yan Ling has suggested, and as we've mentioned, and um, really, Chindal, you agreed that this has to do a lot with coming out of COVID, because it was so much isolation and so much suffering from being alone, that I think Chinese youth have they've just exploded out of this and grabbed onto this idea psychologically that this will be their entry point. And research shows very clearly that group interaction, human connection, community connection, which Chinese society has been built on really in, in collective society, um, is healing. And so I think there is a deep healing that is happening within Chinese students. I gathered it from my discussion last night with my Chinese students in my class, that this was something that all of a sudden they were able to talk about and they came alive. And Bo Shang, you noticed that too. It was like, I fell in love with Bo Shang. She was so expressive, so honest and so sharing that this was like unleashing a part of within themselves. And that's what I think is the psychodynamic that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, Boshan, this unleashing as part of the young people, that that's, uh, seems very to the point uh, about this new trend. Yeah, I believe so. And thank you, Dr. Judy, for such a beautiful commentary. <laughs> I do believe that, yeah, the pandemic has made everyone like stuck in uh, their home because of the quarantine and everything. And it was right to do because, I mean, n nobody wanted to get like the virus. So yeah, it was necessary. But right now we are finally over the pandemic and we are finally trying to go back to the normal life again. And I guess part of like the social media, like because we were on social media so much during the quarantine and that kind of carried over to how we, uh, established relationships right now so there's definitely there's a element of that like fragmented social media style uh kind of connection in like looking for does uh but still I, I do believe this is a positive thing because at least we are reaching out this is like a leashing of energy and just trying to embrace the real world again and building like real life 
connections and it might look a little maybe too much like what we do on social media the kind of like fragmented experience and uh, just showing a part of ourselves maybe in this uh, kind of short-term relationship but uh, i do believe at this moment like this special moment just after the pandemic uh, i think is a positive thing that people are uh, like reaching out and trying to make this new type of friends uh, under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and the personal relationship, human to human, as opposed to the other direction that is going totally towards everybody being an avatar and everybody changing their faces through all these apps that make you look different. This is face to face <laughs> personal experience. And that is what is needed. You know, the interaction with, with Little Red Book, with, with TikTok, um, the, the general look is the, this, you just like swipe, right? And there's so many apps that that's all the expectation was at some point. And then the pendulum swung towards this like antisocial nature, right? You see people literally having dinner pre like pandemic where both people are on a date are like, they're both doing that, right? They're just looking at their phones more than they're talking to each other. And then the pendulum is clearly now swinging the other direction where there's some kind of form, uh, formal interaction that is, you know, being desired, being, uh, craved for in a way and going to the back to the earlier point of what david was saying was that i think on a relative basis if you compare it to perhaps when like david was doing you know these groups and and getting uh come together it looks like it's a bit of a you know step back or simplification um or uh, of of human interaction but you know if you compare it to the status quo of where we're coming from in the social media era it's actually better right and simply by look at anybody that has wechat look at your contact list, how much percentage of that contact list do you actually know? Or did you just add them, right? And you're just like, who are you again? You know? Uh, so yes. I think on a lot of basis, it, it, it's really deep and it's going in the right direction, right? So. Yeah, a lot of people have a probably that kind of a similar experience. You know, you have a long list of your friends, but you are not sure who is who sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but David, you know, some say it, it probably also has something to do with uh, you know, the change of uh, all democrat, uh, demographic change, for example, there are, you know, young people, uh, they are postponed the, the age to get married or some would choose mm -hmm. to be single or not to have kids, for example. This is also mm -hmm. uh, ev I an mean, evolving trend here in China. Uh, does it have something to do with this? Well, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, the, the demographic you mentioned, I mean, of course, there's a, the, this generation is in, in many ways, I think, profoundly different than uh, even the even the previous generations. My feeling is that I think in a certain way that that in a certain way, adults have also kind of be, become, you know, uh, accustomed to in, interacting with people in, the, in this way. And I feel in my personal life, that, that I do have to keep in, in, in contact, but not close contact and not sort of intimate contact with many, many more people than I ever had to worry about before. I mean, I have so many little snippets of email and little bits of interaction that have to do with my commonality with certain people. So I have certain people in academia, I have certain people in the music uh, industry that I work with, I have my family, I have a previous generations that are just keep, you know catching up, people that are about my same age. All of these are like almost like little uh, dots <laughs> that that you know I'll, I will go sometimes back to the U.S. And, and spend an intense weekend with this type of person, catching up with them, you know, with lots of people, too many people to have close uh, interactions uh, with them uh, at at all times. But it seems like that the very nature of society and the fact that we're all distributed all over the globe and we have these these social media and uh, connective tools. That we're all kind of forming these these little little groups, uh, either digital or real, that have their purpose and have their part of your life, and they they you know the, there may be intense act react, you know actions, but not the sort of uh, former sort of lifestyles that people led, which they had their families and basically they had their job, and that was basically it. And nowadays we have many many more f uh, possibilities and many more uh, you know uh, contact groups. Uh, you know, so that I, I think it's affected us all, and maybe that's it's affected the, the the younger generation because they're more comfortable with the technology. From a psychological point of view, now we as psychologists are trying to do what's intergenerational, and so I think that the the Stasi, um kind of real trend 
has the opportunity to bring some of this intergenerational rapport together. So I would advise your audience, Jindo, to think about how they as parents can connect with their youngsters by saying, you know what? Let's have a Dazi outing today. Let's go, what would you like to do with me as Dazi? You know, so that we, you could really use this. That's the way to connect generations. Use the language and the trend and whatever they're doing and be part of it. Well, uh, I mean, that's well said. Yan Lim, also David mentioned about you know, generation differences here in China because uh, the society, the country has developed so rapidly over the past 40 plus years, you know. Uh, but even you know, one year's difference or five years' differences could be a generation, a generational difference yeah. here in China. Uh, I wonder, you know, uh, Dr. Judy mentioned about how to uh, build the rapport between the parents and the children at a different generation. Uh, so your, your observation from afar, now you live in Europe? <laughs> I, I feel I can say a planetary uh, perspective. Uh, that we are really going through this quick iteration of upgrade. And uh, as individual, as organizations, institutions, and entire social structure, technology becoming, you know, the new solace to everybody. That seems to a quick solution to everything. I'm actually so surprised. This is first a conversation nobody bring out of AI, but probably mm -hmm. I bring it up. So this iteration gave us a sense of urgency, but also give us a, like a little, all like a teenager all over again. There's one stimuli in the system, everybody jump, wow, everything, and tomorrow forget, right? So this is the not a uh, human consciousness actually works, right? Or this is the complexity how actually our society works. So there is a na navigation of a nature intelligence. I, I, I agree on uh, Judy was mentioning, how can we bridge this intergeneration gap because that's the intention come from how to be human again in age of machine so i think that's a very very important old story not sexy as a meme as a or mm -hmm. but it's important to share here and that's why that's, i'd love to just voice a few words right right Dr. Really Judy, uh, you know as yanin yeah. said you know we are not robots you know we are buried in all kinds of devices and you know, apps and machines but still we are human beings sometimes we feel lonely we need a companion. So is that also a factor, mm -hmm. probably? <laughs> oh, definitely. And there's no question that there are many levels, as Yen Ling was talking about, all this expansion. OK, so besides being a professor, I'm also a journalist, <laughs> having been on Chinese journal on TV and also magazines and newspapers for many, many years, and also at the United Nations. And so I represent NGOs, and I'm the policy advisor for an ambassador. And so we have a lot of discussions on that very international governmental level about the importance of education and personal interaction of kids in this post-COVID-19 uh, period in developing these social relationships and in kids really getting away from this concentration on the computer and constantly looking into this machine. Now, on top of that, you have Elon Musk and all of these other CEOs of companies saying we need to step back and take a pause, they're saying, from this technology and really get back to one-on-one -on -one human relationships, opening up our heart. This is a very Chinese principle when you think about it. Chinese therapy is very built on these gorgeous ways of heart opening. And I get chills thinking about it. So. Chinese students can lead <laughs> in this movement. Yeah. John, I were a design collective called the Open Hearted Design Alliance. So that's uh, okay. you mentioned confirmation, no confirmation. Yes. <laughs> well, no. with yeah. that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>